Um, so I guess uh, we like to start. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, thank Europa for hosting us. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, we really appreciate being here. And um, I guess we'll start off a little bit about how we got started. Um, and yeah, I mean, how we got into the practice, just a little baseline of, of where we got, how we got to be up here. Um, Ivan and I are brothers and grew up in West Baltimore. You have to look in the eyes for the two of them. They're yeah. the brothers. I'm, I'm the brother from the, another mother, but they're, yeah. they're the um, Yeah, I look more like our dad. He looks more like our mom. A masculine, manly version of my mom. <laughs> I feel like that's an insult in some way, but I don't, he's, we got the same mom, so I really can't get upset with him. But um, we grew up in West Baltimore in the heart of where, uh, the Freddie Gray uprisings happened um, in the heart of where The Wire was filmed. And, uh, but it was a lot different when we grew up there than it is now. Uh, when we grew up there, this was pre-crack hitting the city. And it was uh, a beautiful place to grow up. Um, a lot of love, a lot of connection, a lot of community. It was like one big family. Um, we, outside of our houses, we were just like everyone else. Um, Little League baseball, um, action figures on the porch. This is like... Before everybody had video games, so we played outside all day, hot freeze tag. all night, huh? Freeze tag, freeze tag, like all like so we were outside playing in the streets all the time, but it was safe, like we didn't have to worry about violence or drugs or things along those lines. Inside our house, it was really weird compared to our friends, um, but it was a norm for us. Our dad got into yoga when he had a prostate issue, um, and he got a prostate exam, and he said he never wanted to go through that again, so he went to his best friend's house. <laughs> And he said, uh, he, he, he was just really upset by it. So he was like, uh, I need something. So our godfather, um, who's our teacher now, showed him two poses. He showed him the deer and he showed him the eagle. And he did those two poses, prostate issue went away. He's never had problems with the prostate since then. But uh, he, he was like, well, what is that? Like, uh, this, like, how did you just fix my prostate issue with these two poses? Like, I don't get what this is. He's like, well, it's yoga. And he slid him a copy of the complete illustrated book of yoga, and my dad dove in. And uh, once he finished that, he was like, I want more. Like, we, I, I need to learn more of this stuff. So he, they started going to all these, like, local places in Baltimore and D.C., uh, Northern Virginia and Philly to learn. So they learned kundalini yoga. They learned kriya yoga. They were heavy into transcendental meditation. Um, they learned tantra. They learned anything, everything they could get their hands on. And uh, it stuck. And our dad kind of... He's a basketball coach, so he's very, like, passionate and fanatical about things, I'll say. I'll just put it that way. So um, he forced me and Ottman to meditate every single morning before school. So he would get us up early. We'd still be dark outside, and we would get up, and we'd go to the back room of the house, and we'd sit, and we'd meditate. And then we'd go downstairs and eat breakfast with Woody Woodpecker and Scooby-Doo, and then we would go off to school, like, every single morning, like clockwork. There wasn't a morning where we didn't meditate. It just happened all the time. Even on the weekends, we'd get up and meditate. And um, so yoga was like big in our home. There was a, in our basement, uh, there was a bar. Our, our grandfather owned the house before our parents lived there. And our mom grew up in that house, but there was a bar in the basement. They had turned into like an altar for meditation. Um, we go downstairs for Saturday morning cartoons. Our dad would be in the middle of the floor in a blanket. Um, and it seemed like he was always in the headstand. I think he was trying to master that pose, but he'd just be in the middle of the floor. We'd walk around him, go sit in front of the TV and watch cartoons. Um, our parents were vegan. I mean, I guess we were vegan too. We didn't really have a choice. Uh, there was no, no salt, no sugar in the house. Um, it was just traumatizing as a child when all your friends can like have chips and candy and there's a corner store across the street and in Baltimore, like snowballs or shaved ice are really, really popular. So it's like we would all go to get snowballs and all of our friends would have like the bright, beautiful colors and we would go home and our mom would pour like fresh squeezed orange juice or apple juice on it. We have like dull orange or dull brown. <laughs> and our friends, <laughs> our friends would make fun of us like horribly. So um, they would sneak us chips and candy too though. So I mean, it was kind of like, it was a balance, but me and Ottman had to time like candy that would turn your tongue a certain color. Like we would have to time it so that you would eat it early in the day. And you drink a lot of water and like scrub your tongue to get the red or green off your tongue, and then you got home, and then our mom would be pissed if she saw the color, so we had to really make sure we scrubbed our tongues really well before we went home. Why can I see Mama Cassie, like, open your mouth, let me see. Oh, she was, she was on it. To this day, they still call her Mom Inspector Gadget, because somehow she has, like, this eerie sixth sense to know everything that's going on, so. Um, 
so meditation at home, being vegan, the yoga, all this was going on. Our parents sent us to, uh, um, we grew up in a self-realization fellowship church. I was based on Kriya Yoga and like the commonality in all religions and spiritual practices. And um, Sunday school started with a meditation. There were crystals and incense and readings from like the, start off with the Bible, but then we'd go to like the, the Gita or the Quran or um, Native American spirituality, any everything this guy could do to show that all religions and spiritual practice had the same underlying truths he would read and talk to us about. And um, so that was church. Remember uh, me and Atma being like weirded out the first time we went to our grandparents' church, our dad's parents. Um, it's a Southern Baptist church, like one of those long, like five, six hour churches uh, with like the, the Jesus fans. And like we were weirded out because there was no meditation and no crystals and no incense. So we were trying to figure out like, how do they go to church? Like, I don't understand how they do church and don't meditate. Like what's going on here? And uh, so that was our church experience. Um, and then school, we went to Friends School of Baltimore, which is a Quaker school. All of our other friends went to the public school right up the street from us, Robert Coleman Elementary. So they all went to school together. And me and my brother were like the two weird kids that went to private school. So we went to Quaker school, big on stewardship, um, diversity, like the common light and everyone and everything, and taking a pause before you do anything, and meeting for worship, which was a mindfulness practice unto itself. Uh, <laughs> you got special effects for us, huh? Um, so, friend school was our school. I remember... Um, it felt like it was coming to the wall. It felt like it was coming to the wall. <laughs> and I remember, like, um, back then, Curtis Blow had that song out called Friends, and we would oh, walk down the street, and our friends would sing Friends. How many of us have them? And we'd be, like, so pissed off at them. So... <laughs> So, I mean, I feel like now, if we were kids, we'd have been really cool kids because we were doing yoga and we were vegan and we were meditating and all that, but we were just lame back then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so friend school, all, everything was good. Our parents ended up getting divorced when I was in the sixth grade and I was in the fourth grade. And at that point, our practice went out the window. Um, our mom started going to different churches, so like our our base at the, it was called the Divine Life Church, kind of went out the window too when she was going to like African meth AME churches, she was going to Catholic churches, she was like trying to search for a church home, so that was where we'd go every Sunday, and that became the basis. I mean, I guess that was where we went spiritually at that point, because that's, that's where we were growing up, and that's where our formative years were spent in those places too, so it was kind of like our practice was gone, we lost our practice. And um, fast forward a little bit, we met Andy at the University of Maryland College Park, um, in we, a meditation class? Meditation class. No. no. Um, <laughs> bars and house parties was where we met Andy, um, where you meet, where you make all your friends at the University of Maryland College Park. And um, I feel like when, when I hear your, your story every time, I feel like such a heathen, because <laughs> my youth wasn't like that at all. <laughs> I mean, and then you meet me at the bar, you see? <laughs> Enters Andy I mean, at the bar. We had been to the bar before we met Andy. How about we say that? <laughs> we had been to the bar several times before we met Andy. And uh, we, uh, so, I mean, so we would hang and uh, we, we bonded. We realized that we saw a lot of the world in the same way, like on late night conversations after the bars closed, you're hanging, you're talking. And uh, we saw like a lot of suffering in the world, a lot of pain, a lot of people destroying the environment and a lot of people just not caring and seeming to be apathetic. And uh, we were like, well, well, why is the world like this? Like, this doesn't make any sense to us. So, I mean, our partying literally turned into a book club and we stopped hanging out. Our friends thought we had gone crazy because we were like, instead of being like the first ones at the party, we weren't there. And we would get books, like stacks and stacks of books on any and everything we get our hands on, uh, spirituality, religion, ancient history, philosophy, um, astronomy, astrology, like just stacks of books. And we would just sit and read and watch documentaries. And... Um, our buddy Bill O'Reilly, we watch all the time. Um, just, I mean, be, so we thought he was joking when Fox News first started. And uh, we watched him, we would laugh hysterically because we thought like, this is like the greatest shtick on TV. Like this guy's hilarious. And then like three to four months in, we realized he was serious and we <laughs> turned it off. Um, but we kept reading. And then as we were reading, uh, that's still hilarious to me. Like we, like, we really, really loved Bill O'Reilly at that point. Like, we would, like, we knew when his show came on, like, we would schedule our day around, like, be able to watch it from the beginning. We'd have our books open, and we'd just, like, slap and high fives at what we thought were jokes, but um, dead serious. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we're reading and we're reading and we're reading and we're getting like all these, uh, we're getting more questions than answers and we're not really under, like we're, something's missing here. Like we're, we're not getting enough answers. Like we're getting just more questions. And um, I think it's starting to get, not frustrating, but uh, maybe a little frustrating because we, we, like, we had read every book, not every book on campus, but every book we were interested in on campus. We started buying books outside and we would get a little bit more, but we still have more questions. And then, um, so our godfather was one of those people that got into yoga in like the late 60s, mid, I guess like in the mid 60s-ish, and uh, never got out of it, kept studying, kept practicing, but no one ever approached him about teaching. And um, we, he would always try to introduce us to yoga in like weird ways, but it was like wrong place, wrong time, and we weren't really ready for it. And it was just like really awkward the way he would do it. So we'd be like sitting at his house, drinking and watching football or basketball. And he would say, like, you guys know that uh, alcohol is a toxin and you can get toxins out of your body by doing a cup of the body or a breath of fire. And he would just start doing this. <laughs> and <laughs> so we would, we would uh, definitely cut our trips short and be like, man, what the heck is wrong with you, dude? And we would leave. Like, we would yeah. just get up and, like, look, give each other the look and, <laughs> and like, all right, it's time to go. And, um, yeah, it was like he would give us books that at the time we didn't understand. I remember he gave me a copy of the book, The Holy Science, for my birthday one year. And I remember cracking it open and starting to read it. And I just didn't get any of it. And for a while, it was like I had this lopsided shelf that my TV and uh, PlayStation were on. And I used it to keep my PlayStation balanced so the games wouldn't skip. And um, it's a thin book, but really, really deep, thin book. Uh, but yeah, that's what it was. It, you should definitely pick it up. It's yeah. a very great book. The Holy Science. Yeah, it's worth checking out. But uh, that's what that book did for years. And then it sat on top of uh, my CD player for a while. And I mean, I did finally get it. It's one of my favorite books. But at that time, I just didn't, it just wasn't registering at all. It just didn't resonate with me at all. And uh, so we went to, Ottman actually saw a book on his uh, altar um, about a Kundalini yoga book with like all these practices. And we were, all, all three of us always into like superheroes and Star Wars and things along those lines. So. He saw this book with all these amazing practices in it, with all these amazing benefits, and uh, he was like, yo, this is what we need. Like, we need to learn this stuff. And uh, he went up to him, he's like, so yoga can help you do all these amazing things? He's like, well, no, it's a byproduct. That's not what yoga is really for, but that stuff will happen if you practice. And we were like, well, yeah, well, teach us. We want to learn this stuff. And uh, so he's like, cool. You guys have to agree to be teachers, and you guys have to show up at my house at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning, and we can get it in. So we were like, well, I mean, we don't have anything else to do. Let's... Let's do it. So we showed up and we started practicing, we started learning, and we're still learning to this day from him. Um, still, you still learn a lot, still have a lot more to learn. Like the more we learn, the more we realize that we don't know anything, so we have even more to learn. Um, but, so we started learning from him, we got deep into our practice. Uh, college is finishing up. Andy and I graduate, Ottman still has another semester, about another semester to go. So we had let go our places, we used to hang at Ottman's and read. Uh, that summer. I feel like we, we read and we played a lot of two-on-two two that summer. Yeah. Yeah. Full court two-on-two. Full two. court two-on-two. Two. Yeah. Ottman played for the school, too, so he was very, very good. So you really wanted to try to beat Ottman. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we won more than we lost. Huh? I only beat him once, and it was just because of, he was tired because we were doing full court. Yeah. Did I beat That's you once? Good. I think I beat you once. We're going to say I'll give I you that you story, once. man. Yeah, two on, I'm talking about the two-on-two two games we used to win. Huh? Oh, what, me and you played? Yeah, me and you when we, it was Against me. me and Marina, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did beat you, too. We did beat you all a lot. All right, so me and Andy were the two-on-two <laughs> me and Andy were the two, on two champions that summer. Oh, we'll Lord. just leave the story at that. <sighs> and uh, so we would sit and we were still reading a lot, uh, but most of our, we had shifted to mostly stuff around, like, uh, yoga and yoga philosophy and the practice and the chakras and things along those lines. So we were reading about that and we were watching TV and uh, we were, um, we still knew we wanted to do something. We didn't know what we were going to do. We wanted to do something to help the planet and the people on it and the animals and the, like just everything. We just wanted to do something to help. And um, we saw Matthew Lesko on TV, uh, the guy that, with the lab coat with the dollar signs. He said, let the government help you to write a book. Or uh, th that guy, that dude, we saw him. <laughs> You're like, oh, God. But we believed him. So we believed. <laughs> we believed him. So we were like, Genius! Like the government's gonna pay for us to save the world. Like this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna write grants and we're gonna save the planet, and the government's gonna pay for all of it. And um, <laughs> it sounds so silly when we say it, but that's like literally where we were. Like we were gonna do, we were gonna, 
And we actually went to Ottman's computer and we printed up an EPA grant uh, for ground level ozone detection and we had all the money chart out what we we're gonna do with it. We start filling it out and um, we realized that we don't have a nonprofit, a 513C. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, we, we went through and we started filling out and it just didn't work out. So we scrapped that idea and we just got deeper in our practice. And uh, that was when we moved back into the neighborhood we grew up in right around that time. And um, it was definitely a shell of itself. Um, it was, that family feeling was gone, the love wasn't there, the connection wasn't there, a lot of boarded up houses. Um, and just instead of a community, just individuals just trying to survive and maintain. And uh, it definitely broke our hearts. But uh, at the same time, we knew we had to get deeper into our practice. We had stuff that we were still trying to figure out about it. And we knew that we had, and our teacher would always say to us, you gotta be a scientist, you gotta experiment, you gotta be a scientist. Because he would always tell us the benefit of certain practices, but he'd always also say to us, well, I could be totally lying to you all. Uh, I'd be making all this stuff up and you would never know unless you actually did the experiments on yourself. So we decided to do the experiments on ourselves, and during that time, it was like, the, it, was, it was probably one of the happiest times of our lives. Like, we had time to practice. Like, we would get up at 4 a.m., we would do our own practice, to, whether we were together or with our teacher. We would finish, we would talk about um, the books we were reading, our dreams, like experiments with like astral projection and like any type of, any type of stuff like along those lines, what we were doing. And uh, we, our friends, again, our friends thought we were a little weird. They would come by and visit us. I'm like, how can you guys possibly be this happy? Like, you guys live in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Baltimore City. You guys are dead broke. You guys don't have jobs. Like, I don't understand how you all can be happy. And that was when we realized we had to start sharing the practice with other people. So um, we went and we, we went back to the, the whole Matthew Lesko and saving the world using government money. And uh, we started a nonprofit, but we didn't know how to do it. So we went to um, askjeeves.com. This is pre-Google. So we typed in. We, we asked Jeeves, how do you start a nonprofit in the state of Maryland? And we printed up the checklist, and we went through, and we started a nonprofit. So, um, yeah, our dad always pushed us to be entrepreneurs. He didn't want us to go get jobs. He felt like that was one of the biggest um, mistakes that he made was going and working for other people. And this was around a time when a lot of his friends were getting downsized and losing their jobs and uh, were just miserable. And he was like, well, I don't want you guys to do that. So you guys start a business. You guys do your own thing, and you guys figure it out. And uh, he wanted us to do... Something that would be a little more lucrative than a nonprofit, and was really kind of pissed about that at first, because <laughs> he was supporting us. Uh, he was the one that was like, we moved in the house that we grew up in, so he was taking care of the bill. It, the agreement was that if we put all of our energy and to start whatever business we had, he would support us. So he did that, and I think he was expecting us to do like there were some good real estate opportunities in Baltimore at that time, so he wanted us to do something on those lines. But that just didn't really feel good to us, so we started the Holistic Life Foundation, and. Um, yeah, so we, 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 had an, we had a nonprofit, we had our practice, and we didn't really have, and that was it. Like, we didn't have anything else going on. Great job, me? Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> do uh, we want to do a practice, or do you want me to continue with the story? Let's do another practice. Let's do a practice. All right. Um, so before we continue as HLF forms, we're going to do uh, another practice we do. Um, everywhere we go, we always start with the breath. So this is going to seem kind of basic, because we're just going to go over teaching you how to breathe today. And um, y'all doing a pretty good job at it, by the way. Let's keep it up. Um, uh, so um, I'll, go, I'll give them the kind of the short version so that we uh, make sure we have plenty of time. Um, so the way we always like to start is, is, is envision a baby, an infant. They breathe perfectly. They're always breathing in and out of their noses. Inhale, belly rises. Exhale, belly falls, right? Um, for some reason, as we get older, we start breathing like we're animals. We start panting. So that's, these really shallow breaths, all right? So um, this breathing technique is just going to be a basic belly breath. It's going to be diaphragmic breathing. Um, we want to make sure that you focus on breathing through your nose while you're doing this technique. And I'm going to teach you the same way that we would teach pre-K kids or the same way we would do at a drug treatment center. So we always do the same shtick, kind of. And um, we're always using a reciprocal teaching model, the goal being that um, when we teach, uh, ideally, you become teachers, just like our teacher asked us, and then you can go into your communities and your homes and your neighborhoods and make an impact as well. Um, so uh, your nose is three main things. It is a heater, it is a filter, and it is a humidifier. You have nose hairs in your nose. That's your filtration system. A lot of times when we teach young kids, they're like, we don't have any of those. And I'm always like, oh, they coming. <laughs> they coming. 
right? So you, that's your filtration system when you're breathing out your nose. Um, you have your mucous membranes that line your nasal passage, and that's what warms the air up. It's very important, especially if you are a mouth breather and then you step outside and you keep breathing in the cold air. That temperature shift from cold, from warm to cold can shock your bronx. So you want to make sure you're breathing in through your nose and bring in that nice warm air. And you have glands in your cheeks that make the moisture for your tears, and that's your humidifying system. So always in and out of your nose, y'all, okay? I love doing this because all of y'all have your mouths closed right now, and you're looking at me like, man, we breathe like this all the time. What you talking about? <laughs> okay. So you also want to make sure that when you're doing the breathing that you're not doing what we call the Superman breath. I need to stand up to show, you, to show this to you because a lot of times when we tell people to take a deep breath, they do this. I'll say, take a deep breath, and they go. <laughs> it was a deep breath, right? You see that? And I only did top portion of my lungs. Our lungs are shaped kind of like teardrops, right? So when you're breathing like that and you're shooting the air straight up to your top portion of your lungs, you're only using 10% of it. We want to make sure we're manipulating our diaphragms. We're creating that vacuum to bring the air down and it goes and fills your lower lungs first, okay? So that's the way we're gonna to try to work on this exercise, okay? Um, the inhale is super important because that's what's kind of like cleaning your blood out. Your heart and your lungs are attached to each other. Nice, long, deep breaths. All the oxygen hits your blood. They say when your blood leaves your heart, it's like a pristine mountain stream. It's rich with all this oxygen. It's clean, distributes all the oxygen as it goes throughout your body, picks up any impurities, comes back to your heart, and they say it's like sewer water when it comes back again. Oxygen hits it, cleans it up, and you clean your blood up. But you can imagine if you're panting all day long, not taking long, deep breaths like we'll do today, you're not going to be cleaning your blood up as much, and that can lead to issues later on in life. All right? um, so nice, long, deep inhales, what we want you to be doing today. And remember, your exhale is equally as important. So you want to make sure when you exhale, you push all that stale CO2 out your body. And you're also pushing out ruminating thoughts. There's a direct link to those thoughts that are in your mind that are just sitting in your mind. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. Right now, you could be like, wow, was that train really going to come through the wall? Um, it's 8 o'clock right now. I got something to do at 8.30. There's this TV show on. Is Bill O'Reilly going to be on? Maybe I'll check his show out. Huh. Was he really joking all those times, or was he serious? Mm. That, that hummus sandwich was really, really good. You know, and so you have all these thoughts, and you're not here. You're not present, right? So your exhales help with that. So when you fully exhale, you get rid of those ruminating thoughts so you can be in this moment, all right? Um, the way we do the exercise, very simple. I need to stand for this as well. You can take your hand, and you can place your hand on your belly. You can watch me now, or do it with me. doesn't matter. We'll do a bunch of them together, and I'll, I'll rotate so I'll be your model for this, okay? <laughs> um, when you inhale, you want to imagine that you're filling, filling your belly up with air. That doesn't, it's not physically possible. But that's what it's going to look like. So when you inhale, uh, imagine your belly's like a balloon. So you inhale, and you push your belly out as far as possible. Big belly. See that? <laughs> okay, we're working on that just for y'all. This demonstration. All right, then you leave your hand there. You exhale and you pull your belly away from your hand. Create that space. See the space? Inhale. Connect it. Exhale. Pull away. All right? That's just for some people. Um, a lot of times we'll get people that will raise their hands and when we do this exercise, they'll be like, uh, my body don't work that way, right? Um, it's just practice. You know, it's the natural way that you're supposed to be breathing and you're just retraining yourself to breathe the proper way, all right? So I'm gonna welcome y'all to get in a nice, comfortable seated position. Ideally, your head, neck, and spine align, feet grounded on the floor. You're welcome to close your eyes, it's up to you. I think it helps with distractions, but again, completely up to you. And you can go ahead and take a hand, any hand, place it on your belly, and we'll do the breathing together. Remember, all the breathing's in and out of our noses. So everyone, inhale nice and deep, and push your stomach out. Imagine it's filling up with air like it's a balloon. Leave your hand there, exhale, and pull your belly away from your hand. Imagine you're trying to get your belly button to touch your spine. Inhale deep, pushing your belly back out to your hand. Your breathing sounds great. Exhale it all out. You can use your imagination while you're doing this as well. Inhale nice and deep. See and feel that healing oxygen coming into your body. Exhale. Push out all that stale CO2. Any worries, any thoughts. Inhale deep. Feel your body slowing. Exhale it all out. Inhale deep. Exhale it out. Inhale deep. Exhale. Take a few more together. Inhale nice and deep. 
Exhale it all out. Inhale. Exhale. Last one together. Inhale, nice and deep, slow, deep breath. Exhale it all out. Before opening your eyes, take three deep breaths on your own. This is where you're being a scientist. You're doing an internal assessment and you're asking yourself, how does my mind feel? Is it racing or is it clear? How does my body feel? Is it tense or is it relaxed? And know that you can feel this way again just by taking a few deep breaths any moment of the day. And when you finish, you can slowly, slowly blink your eyes open and come back to your senses. I always love how the room feels after that exercise. Um, that, there's a story I always like to tell about that. Um, when we're working with kids, countless times that I've had, uh, usually younger kids, after they're fighting, uh, you pull them apart from each other, and one person grabs one student, I'll grab one of the other kids, and they're doing that, you know, hands clenched, like, <laughs> what they said, and they did, and da da da, right? And they're going, and they're wilding out. And you tell the kid, put your, I always say, don't put your hand on your heart. And they, and they do, and they feel this. And I say, now do the breathing. And usually they try to do it in and out of their mouth because they're still in that like <laughs> mode. And I'm like, no, in and out your nose. And they'll see this, goes to this. And their eyes always open up real big. And they're always like, thank you, Mr. Andy. And I'm always like, I ain't doing it. Don't thank me. You're in control. You did that. It's so amazing to see that transformation happen in them, how when they learn that they are able to regulate themselves and then in those heightened states they can control themselves and bring them down. And it's just an amazing tool. You know, it's something you always have with you. Uh, like Sharon Salzberg says, it's, it's portable. Your breath is portable. Yeah, so um, just a, something that hopefully uh, when you leave today after our talk, that's a technique that uh, you'll be paying attention to more. Um, you know, we take over 20,000 breaths a day and if you think about it, how many of those you actually are conscious of that you're the one taking the breaths? Um, what's John, John Kevinson always says, if, if humans were, um, if they were in charge of breathing, we'd all be dead. So. It, it may seem elementary, but it's the foundation of everything that we teach. You know, your life starts with your first breath and ends with your last, so your breath must be important. I, I remember when, when we graduated and our teacher taught us this technique, I remember thinking to myself, how in the world did I go through all this education and no one told me how to breathe? <laughs> wow. So back to the story. Um, so we have a program, or we have a no, a, program. a, no programs, we have a nonprofit, um, we have a name, we're eager to, to share what's, what's transformed ourselves, and uh, we don't really have anything to do. And one day we go to an elementary school to pick up Ali and Atma's mother, Their work, she's working at the school, and uh, this is when it was in the introduction. Uh, they were like, hey, do y'all want to be football coaches for these group of problem kids? We're like, you know, well, instead of being football coaches, uh, since we had our own practice and we were feeling the way we were, like, do you think maybe we could teach them some of these yoga techniques? Um, you know, they are problem kids, so maybe teaching them tools to slow themselves down might be a little better than bashing them into each other. Um, so, <laughs> you think, right? At this time, this is in like 2001, so like yoga isn't really popular at that time in the area, at least, that we're in. So it's like, the teacher, you could tell the principal was like, uh, I don't care, so long as you ought to give me some free aftercare, just do what you do, right? So they put us like in the corner basement of the school where like no one knew what we were doing. Um, <laughs> And that first day, we have the yoga mats out, and the kids pick them up, and they smack each other over the heads, and they're like, WrestleMania! And we're looking at each other like, oh, maybe you made a mistake here. Uh, the kids are really rambunctious. Um, first few weeks, there's like half of them were at detention, um, and they start getting into the practice. And even when we mentioned yoga to them the first time, they were like, the kids were like, yogurt? <laughs> Yoda? What, what are you talking about? Um, so we had to completely introduce them to these concepts. Um, and we just tried to make it as practical and relatable to them in their lives as possible. Uh, weeks start passing, and now there's only like three kids in the tension, then no kids in the tension, and the teachers and the parents, they're like, look, we don't know what y'all are doing down there. <laughs> we don't care what y'all are doing down there. Just keep doing it, OK? Um, so we had these kids that had transformed. It was awesome. Um, and we wanted to stick with them. 
So um, they all went to different middle schools, and we took it upon ourselves to go and pick them up. So we'd all get into our separate cars, we'd travel all throughout the city, we'd pick the kids up, and we'd take them to a centralized location, and we kept with their practice. Um, all the way, that was all the way through when they got into high school. Um, we picked up more kids along the way, so they would start just adding friends to us. So we were like driving around in clown cars. Like sometimes we'd have like 12 kids in my Camry. We got pulled over once, and like there's like kids like laying on top of each other <laughs> in the back seat. And the police officer's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and I'm like, well, we have an after school program. We teach yoga. And he looks at me like, yeah, right. No, <laughs> what are y'all doing? And we're like, no, ask him. And then all the kids would talk about meditation and be like, yeah, it helps me with my grades and stuff. And the police officer's like, go on your way. You're fine. <laughs> so um, it keeps growing and growing. Um, those kids get into high school. <laughs> And, uh, and we don't have a group of kids anymore because uh, they're doing sports and girlfriends and stuff like that. Uh, and then a guy in the neighborhood, one of the big brothers that Ali and Atman had, um, comes to Atman and he's like, hey, you know, I hear this great work y'all doing in the city with these other kids. Well, what about the kids in the neighborhood? And then it's like, boom, right in front of us, a whole new group of kids that are kind of like vandalizing and terrorizing the neighborhood. Um, Atman goes up to one of them and lets them know about the program, tells them about the gym that we're going to get them, YMCA passes and the swimming pool and field trips. Does not mention the yoga. That was essential to this, right? <laughs> so they're excited. Um, we take them into the gym and we do all the, play some basketball, have some fun. We take them to the yoga and they're like, man, you tricked us. And we're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that group keeps growing. And that's when we started getting uh, a few ladies in the program because all the, the, the gentlemen we went up to, all their sisters were like, oh, we in your program too. Okay, you can't stop us. And we're like, oh, I guess you're in the program too. Okay. So um, fast forward a little. We would, we have a few more stories we'll tell, but uh, the main thing is we uh, ended up going into the uh, elementary school right in our neighborhood, the same elementary school that Ali and Atma's mother went to. And um, that all our friends from our neighborhood went to. Yeah, and, um, and we had a group, a family that was kind of rambunctious, and the, we told the principal we were working with those kids, she's like, oh yeah, you can come into my school for sure. Um, so I'll tell one, little, one more little story about little Anthony, because he's amazing. Oh, so um, within that first year that we were in the school, we've only been working with kids that are kind of, I think the youngest were like third grade, second grade. Mm -hmm. And the prince was like, look, if you're going to stay here, you have to work with this one little guy. He's a pre-K kid, and he curses like a sailor. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, whatever. So the first time Anthony comes in, he gets riled up a little. He starts dropping F-bombs and MFers and every, and I mean, correct context, too. Yeah. Like, he wasn't using the words the wrong way. He was using them the correct way. And you were just he like... He was a poet with them curse words. Unbelievable. This is amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, it's masterful for a pre-K kid, right? Uh, it was language skills. <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. <she's, laughs> so um, by the end of the year, we hadn't solved it completely. You know, if he would say it, he would, he would censor himself. So he'd get real mad and be like, you B. And that's all he would say. So he wouldn't say the word. Or he'd be like, you M F -er. And he would like hold it. Or if he did say it, and one of us caught him saying a curse word, he would look at us and he'd go, no, 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 no. Because he knew that his mom would get told and things would not be good at home. I remember one of his goes to's was Mother Freaker. Mother Freaker. Amazing kids. So um, <laughs> fast forward. So that was when in that after school program, we probably had like 30 kids uh, now. We'll move all the way to present day. We're at around 160 kids that we have in that neighborhood. Um, that one is actually funded by the government. <laughs> Matthew, let's go, huh? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, it took forever, but still. Um, and, uh, and, and so we do everything in there, academic help, enrichment activities. Um, and then we also do an hour of the mindfulness yoga time every single day. And that's kind of like our training grounds. Um, the first group of guys that we had in 2001 over half of them are still employed by us now. So they've stuck with us that entire time. Um, some of them graduated from very, very nice schools and still decided to come back because of the impact that it had on their lives and they wanted to make that same impact in their neighborhoods. Um, some of them stuck with us the entire time and really just would be thankful to us and say, hey, you know, if it wasn't for y'all, I would either be dead or locked up somewhere. And, uh, and now I'm able to make a living for myself and to provide for my family. So it's a really beautiful thing that's happened with our programs. Um, Thank you. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Um, so maybe go over some of our programs and then. Yeah, or just with the sh so, like so, things were going good with us, and then I, I think a big shift happened when um, the three of us had to start turning down contracts, like because it was just the three of us doing everything. Like we literally thought the three of us were going to do all this work and make this big huge impact, um, trying to run an organization administratively and programmatically. And I got to a point where we couldn't, we couldn't 
take on any more contracts. We were turning stuff down. And um, we were kind of beating ourselves up about it because like, our goal was to help as many people as possible, but we couldn't do that anymore. And that was when we started looking at those younger guys that had come through our program when they were in the fifth grade in 01. And then now they were, they were young at that point, They're probably like 22 at that point, maybe, 21, 22. And they were like, well, they've been practicing for like a decade. Why don't we just hire them and, and, and bring them on? And so we brought on three of them at first. And then things were going good for a while. And then we kind of spinning our wheels for a couple of years. And then we bumped into the, um, we kind of met the, the, our program officers from the 1440 Foundation. And they, um, they were going to give us our first big like investment uh, from a foundation. It was going to be, I think the first year was going to be like twenty dollars or $25,000. And they got back a proposal. And they said we were going to hire an assistant. That was the first thing we were going to do. And uh, they were kind of pissed off at us, really, because they were like, you guys have been volunteering doing this for free for eight years. You guys work on the weekends. We were all working in a mental crisis facility for 24 hours. We worked like a double on Saturday and then a single shift on Sunday. So we worked 24 hours on the weekends on top of the 40 to 60 hours we were working during the week. And they were like, well, why don't you guys pay yourselves? And we were like, well, I mean, if we hire someone, we can get all this other stuff done. They were like, no. And uh, they bought us up to their house for a weekend. And they taught us about how to run a nonprofit. And they used, it was kind of cool because they used all sports and uh, and yoga terminology to teach us how to run a nonprofit, and it worked out perfectly because it was like, oh, you're speaking our language. This is easy. And um, they, I, mean, I think one of the big points, uh, two of the big things were like, one, they explained this about like energy in the universe. Like nothing in the in, in the universe just puts out energy all the time and doesn't get anything back. You, that's what we were doing. We we're burning ourselves out, and it was just like we weren't and. Our energy being put out was the programs we were doing and the help we were giving in the communities. We weren't getting any resources back to kind of sustain ourselves and sustain our organization. And the second thing was I felt like we were, we were all about like doing the work and not worrying about, worrying about the money that we were getting back in. But our program officer was like, look, I'm, I'm just as much of a yogi as you guys are, but look at my house. I clearly like money. Like there's nothing wrong with it. Like you guys have to use it as a tool. And um, so we went back home, and, oh, and they also they took up our, um, they allowed us to hire an assistant, but they took up our grant award by, um, it took up to like forty or $45,000. We had to use the extra money to give ourselves like a stipend, and that was the only way they were going to give us a grant. So we were like, fine, we'll do this. And um, We thought we were rich yeah, then. <laughs> yeah, oh man. Yeah, I mean, going from zero to like $7,000 in a year was like, oh man, like we're killing it now. Uh, but Until tax time. Yeah, right? Mm. Yeah, oh man. And then, uh, so, so we, we did that, and we started uh, growing our organization, and then we had to start, um, it, was, it was a tough time for us, we had to start stepping away from our programs, and uh, we still have our responsibilities, so we each took a different role in the organization, doing different things, and uh, it, it helped us grow and build infrastructure, but it was like the first time that we weren't on the ground doing the programs uh, every day, single day. It got to a point where we weren't... Um, like we, were, we knew every single, like I think one of the things that funders were most impressed about is that three of us could walk into a gym. We were working with like say 75 kids at the school, and just at this one at school, the after school program, we could name every single kid in there. And then it got to a point where we would go and we didn't know all the kids there and it kind of hurt us. We were like, damn, like what are we, are we doing something wrong? Like we were trying to figure out what was, like if we were doing the right thing, but like our number of students was uh, increasing. I guess we can talk about that later. But yeah, that, that was where the shift was. And we had to realize we had to start diversifying our programming to like, to help more people during different parts of the day than just this after school program. Jump to another practice or program? Jump to maybe our programs, where they look now. All right, um, so uh, to break down a couple of our programs, uh, you all may have seen a viral article online uh, changing detention to meditation. Uh, that's kind of highlighting our um, Mindful Moment program, which is a school wide initiative. Uh, the principal gives us uh, 15 minutes at the beginning of the day and 15 minutes at the end of the day for a uh, mindfulness practice uh, where, you know, we start off with some belly breaths like Andy does or just taught you all. Um, then we do a little, bit <laughs> a little bit of movement. I'm sorry, every time I say the word movement, I have to like move my wrist and it's like a funny joke. And we've, but, been, we've been talking for a long time, so if you ever see any of our videos, if you ever see Atman say movement, he'll do this. And so, since he knows now that, that we catch him with that, he tries to put in his hands so he, he'll still do one of these with his shoulders. <laughs> so he tries to catch himself, and he did for a second. But I was there, mindful right there. I was mindful. I caught it. Yeah. Um, so the 15-minute routine, belly breathing, uh, movement, uh, some specific breathing exercise. We may get into maybe one of those a little bit later, um, and a silent reflection on the breath. 
Um, and besides the 15 minute practice at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, to kind of get the kids at the beginning of the day, you know, kids are dealing with a lot of trauma at, at home, in their neighborhood. So it kind of kind of helps them drop in and kind of release some of that stress and get into that present moment so they can actually be active in school or present in school. Um, and then at the end of the day, to kind of boost up their energy before they have to go back into their home. Uh, besides the 15-minute uh, practice at the beginning of the day, at the, at the, at the end of the day, uh, we have an alternative to suspension room, which is called the mindful moment room, which is kind of like an oasis in the school. Um, we have like uh, meditation cushions, zafus, um, an oil diffuser, Himalayan salt crystals, inspirational posters, uh, like little waterfalls. Um, tea machine, kids love tea. Uh, and then we have like three staff staffing the room. Uh, so if kids are in crisis, they can either uh, refer themselves or the teachers can refer them to our staff. Um, our staff, they're not counselors, so they don't counsel kids. Uh, but we are trained in like active listening and mirroring, which empowers the youth. You know, nobody ever listens to kids. So, you know, if you're listening to them actively and then, you know, you're mirroring what they're saying, it empowers them. Uh, and then after that, uh, we do uh, some breathing exercises, do a meditation, um, and then give them some tea. And within uh, 15 minutes, uh, we send them back to class. And like, I think Andy said this, that uh, you know, in the elementary school that's in the epicenter of all the Freddie Gray uprising, uh, for four years now, uh, there's been zero suspensions. And that's amazing uh, for Baltimore City School. Um, and then we also have that program in the high school. And you know, uh, when people get older, they get too cool for school and they don't want to stand out. Um, so we kind of like the, the 15 minute practice was kind of slacking uh, at the high school. So what we did is we um, trained 20% of the student population uh, in like a deeper practice and they were our mindful ambassadors. Uh, so during the 15 minute practice, we kind of had like agent provocateurs in the class where they would, we knew they would be doing the um, practices and kind of make everyone else feel more comfortable in doing the practices. And uh, at that high school, uh, you know, it was known for riots. It was always on world star hip hop, if y'all know what that is. Um, and uh, the coolest thing is, is like after, um, you know, after the program uh, kicked off there, uh, the first year, uh, freshman promotions went up, freshman GPAs went up, uh, fights went down. And you know, in, in Baltimore schools, like the last week of school uh, is when everybody takes out their beefs or you know, if they have a disagreement with someone, uh, they take it out that last week of school. And because um, they know they're not gonna get suspended or their parents won't find out because school will be over by the time the, the school kind of calls their parents. But uh, the thing that the uh, principal and the teachers told us, it was like this was the first year that that didn't go down. Like the last week of school was just smooth and peaceful. Um, and a couple other, um, I guess, realizations that the principal told us uh, that he noticed at his school was that, you know, the school climate was a lot more peaceful than it was at other schools. He would go into other schools and kind of feel the chaos and then come back into his school and kind of feel the calm and peace. Um, and, you know, another cool story he told us is that, you know, he saw, uh, you know how I said we have like three staff staff in the room. Sometimes they're not in the room because they have to do like outreach to uh, a class that, you know, so that, that needs a little bit of extra help or a teacher during their planning period uh, for self-care. So like all of our staff were out of the room and it was a student in crisis. And uh, the student came to the room, the door was locked. And you know, like uh, Andy was saying, our whole model is reciprocal teaching model. So everybody knows how to lead themselves through the practices. Uh, he proceeded to just sit on the floor and start doing his practice, meditating or doing silent reflection right then and there, like in a busy hallway. Uh, our room is on the first floor where it's the most traffic. Uh, and the thing that the principal told us, he was like, it was amazing that, you know, this is part of our school culture now. Like before, you know, somebody would have just punched him in the mouth because he was sitting down and or kicked him. Now, you know, it's people looking at him like it's normal. And he was like, you know, I appreciate, you know, the change in the school climate. Um, yeah, and uh, that, that's as far as the Mindful Moment program. Um, we, we get highlighted for youth work, uh, the kids, the, the work that we do in the elementary schools, just because like uh, people like taking pictures of kids from the hood doing yoga and meditating and stuff. Uh, but we do, you know, a lot of other work too, uh, a lot of underserved communities, uh, whether it's drug rehab classes, adult drug rehab, um, adult homeless classes, uh, adult mental illness facilities. We're in both uh, juvenile justice facilities in Baltimore, um, 
any and everywhere that we can kind of offer these services to underserved communities. That's what we did uh, at the beginning. But, you know, uh, Ali and I kind of went to friend, well, not kind of went to friends, we went to friend school. And, you know, uh, it's like a lot of affluent people that went to friends and we kind of reflected on the fact that, you know, they were dealing with stress too. Uh, di it looked a lot different, but, you know, like high uh, achievement uh, stress, you know, and, you know, parents, and you know, in our community, maybe gone because they they may, might be locked up, or you know, they might not just they might not be coming home for any any specific reason. But same thing with these parents; they will be going out of town for weeks at a time and leaving their kids. So you know, the kids are still with the same issues. So we started uh, actively, uh, you know, teaching practices in like all the private schools in Baltimore uh, and honestly around the nation. Um, so we now we teach any and everybody who wants to learn. Um, two more programs, I guess, a highlight for, and if you can add to anything, Ali, that you want to as well. Um, one of them is our residency program. Uh, it's a program where we'll go into a school and we'll entrench ourselves for a full week. The first uh, day will be just large groups. We're introducing um, them to what we'll do. Uh, the following three days will be us going into separate classrooms, so the three of us will go, and each of us will see every single student um, doing that reciprocal teaching model. So on Tuesday, uh, we're leading the exercise. Wednesday, we bring a student up with us. They help us lead the exercise. Thursday, the student comes up by themselves, and they lead the exercise. Friday, we do a review. And the, and the goal of that is that when we leave, the kids will start incorporating the techniques themselves into their school day. So ideally, a uh, test comes around and Johnny will raise his hand and be like, hey, guys, let's do the uh, stress breath because this helps with test anxiety and Johnny will lead the class through the, the, the practice. Um, I think one of the coolest things about that program um, that we found, uh, it was probably like our second year that we did it there and we, did, we were doing it in Madison, Wisconsin at that time. Um, when we left, we always, um, got the kids to make a promise to us where we said that we wanted to make sure that they would help people. You know, that we, we've been teaching them to be teachers, so we wanted them to make a promise to us that when they go into their communities, that they make an impact and they try to, whenever they see a need, they're out there to help people. And we got the whole school to scream like, yeah, we're gonna help people, right? And they're screaming at the end. And I think the thing was most amazing at, at the end of that, that, that second year was, you know, these kids are like crying as we're leaving and asking us for autographs. And we're like, this is crazy, you know? We just taught them some breathing techniques, right? Um, <laughs> but I think uh, one of the most amazing things that we learned from that is that uh, in that school, we were making compassion cool. You know, we, we were making kids, instead of wanting to be movie stars or athletes or rappers or whatever it is, uh, they wanted to go out and help people. And it was very, very impactful. And actually, I was wondering if you would share the one story that's really amazing from that. All right, uh, so uh, like Andy was saying, the first day that we do the residency program, it's in the library and we have like three grades uh, in the library. And we kind of noticed that there was a little girl that was sitting in the back of the room. And you know how sometimes if uh, kids are dealing with a lot, they have like one-on-ones. Uh, so this uh, little girl was kind of hugged up on her one-on-one -on -one, and we knew that she was dealing with a lot of trauma. Um, so we talked to, uh, they call them specials. We talked to her special at uh, the end of the session. And she told us, you know, uh, the abuse that she faced and you know that you know she honestly like you know lived in a cage for years uh, so she was dealing with a lot of trauma and she was saying that um, she you know was supposed to stay away from men and definitely was supposed to stay away from black men um, so we kind of uh, took that as a challenge you know just to kind of shower her with love and empower her while we were there uh, so like Andy was saying, whenever we would call somebody up to the front of the room, we made sure she would come up to the room. And, you know, we always gave her like round of applause and, you know, complimented her. And, uh, you know, she ended up uh, giving us a hug one day, giving us each a hug. And, you know, the special, her one-on-one -on -one was crying about the situation. And, you know, she was like, you have no idea how much this girl has grown in the three days that you all were there. Uh, you know, like I said, she said that she wasn't supposed to be around men and especially black men and for her to give us a hug was amazing. Um, and then, you know, we just, you know, kept uh, building her up during the course of the week. And, you know, it was the last day and, you know, she came up to me and gave me a hug and, you know, she said, I, I have something that I have to ask you. I was like, cool, you know, ask me whatever you want to. And, you know, she was like, uh, do you think you can be my dad? And I was like, 
I don't know if I can be your dad, <laughs> but you know, whenever you're missing me or you want to think about me, I'll be right here in your heart, you know? And the coolest thing is, is like, you know, like Andy said, we go out there every single year and she is like a social butterfly thriving, you know what I mean? So, you know, it, and that was just like a, a week of work and empowering and kind of seeing people, like seeing them and hearing them. That, that's all that was. Um, one more program I just wanted to highlight is our workforce development program. So remember Ali was talking about how I got to a point where we were having to kind of turn down contracts and there wasn't enough of us and we saw that group of guys uh, that were with us for all these years and we're like, well, we're going to start, you know, get them to work on their practice a little more. So we took them up in the woods in North Carolina uh, for a week and we're, we're camping, yeah, right? They were, most of them had never been camping or anything like that and we were like for real deal camping. So we had, it was no power. Um, there was a little running water, but it all smelled like sulfur, so we couldn't really drink out of it. Um, I remember the first night we got there, uh, one of the young men that was with us, like he turns on the, he turns on the water from the well, and he sips, and he's like, ew, this water tastes like poop. And it was like just the sulfur smell coming from it, so we, we had no water. Um, and, you know, we're vegetarian, so we were like, only vegetarian meals for this, and they're looking at us like, y'all are crazy, what are you doing to us, you're torturing us. Um, they had no internet signal, so unless they like walk like half mile up this big hill. So uh, this is like the first time that they're out in nature, like for a long, prolonged period of time. You had to get the water, lay it out in the sun in the morning, so at nighttime you hung it from a tree and that's how you showered, right? Um, and we cooked all our meals together, and it was this great, it was just this great experience, and um, they reminded us so much of us when we were in our book club, and the three of us were reading, and one of us would be reading, and be like, oh, wow, look at this, and the other person would be reading a different book, like, oh, like, and we'd always be sharing, and, and we saw them in their little groups doing the same thing. They all had their books, and they're talking about the chakras for the first time, or they're talking about uh, this kundalini practice, or oh, what about when we, when we do the breathing exercise tomorrow, I want to make sure we do this, or we, they had the same book that Atma saw from Yogi Bhaj and the, uh, with the meditations, they're like, can we do this meditation next time, and you could just it was just such an amazing experience for them. And one of the best stories I feel that came from that trip was um, at one point we had to go get supplies. Uh, it was probably like three or four days into it. And we, so we had to drive all the way down the road to, oh, it was a Walmart, right? It was like a super Walmart, super Walmart too. Walmart, yeah. So it was like mm -hmm. ginormous. And uh, so, they, you know, we've been living in the woods for a good four days. Like, we're pretty funky at this point. And uh, we walk in, and like right when we walk in, one of the kids just looks and he's probably like 18, 20 some years old. He just looks around and he goes, why do we need all this shit? <laughs> and it was such an amazing experience for them, you know? And, and we could feel when after that trip, us driving back into the city and as they were getting closer to the city, you could feel their energy in the bus like, huh. Like we pulled off a 295 and immediately someone's getting handcuffed on the corner and they're just like, I wanna be back in the woods, man. And then it was over the next, two of the guys that were supposed to come with us on that trip that didn't make it, they were part of that group, one of them got stabbed. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and uh, one of them got locked up, right? Yeah. So. And then when we got back, uh, Somebody got a, a gun pulled on, on him and like I robbed of his clothes and you know he immediately called us like man I need to get out of Baltimore I want to go back to North Carolina. So it was just a, it was it's a really interesting experience I think for them to see um, that there's a different way of experiencing life and living and there's more than just their city and that's what we do with a lot of the, the kids and uh, that we would try to work with to show uh, increase their scope and scale and kind of see that it's not just their block you know some people in Baltimore have never been to the East Side. You know, some people have never been to the West Side. Um, so we try to take them as many places as we can and get them to experience all sorts of new things. And um, that core group to this day are like, when we going camping again? When we going mm. camping again? It was it's a little expensive, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll take all of them. Yeah. Um, so I think just a couple more things before we open up for questions. Um, it hasn't been, e like, we're laughing and joking about it now, but there were some really rough times uh, trying to get through all this and make this work. I mean, we knew that this was what we wanted to do and it wasn't gonna be easy, but um, I think a few things helped us through. One was having each other. Like we were struggling together, we weren't struggling solo the same. I was just as broke as they were, they were just as broke as I was. Um, like it was just one of those things that we struggled together and we knew that if we stayed together, that we can make, we can make it happen. It was just gonna be a rough road. Um, we all have our own personal practice. I think that helps keep us grounded. Um, there's not a day that goes by where we're not gonna at least at least meditate at the minimum. I mean, we, ideally we would have more time to um, pull out our mats and get some physical practice in, but the bare minimum is meditation and some off the mat practices, like just to kind of keep ourselves sane and, and get through all of this. Um, 
we're going to be ourselves no matter what. Um, it's kind of, it's opened some doors, but it's also closed some doors. But we figured just being authentic and being ourselves the way to go about it. Um, and he even wore probably those same sweatpants. No, they're the gray ones. Oh, I the wore gray them on ones. The other day. So we, we got invited to the, to the White House for this, um, what is it, the round table discussion on complimentary medicine or something like that. And uh, Andy's mom was so pissed that he wore sweatpants. But he's like, Mom, I wear sweatpants everywhere. I'm going to wear my sweatpants. And that's just <laughs> been the way that we, we function, we operate. Like, you're going to get the three of us just like this, no matter where you see us, no matter what we're doing, no matter who we're around. Um, coming from a place of love has been very important for us. Um, like we, Andy says I love you to people a lot. Um, and even in places where we can't say I love you, like um, we work on embodying love. I mean, and just being love around people so they'll see our interactions with each other and the kids we work with, the adults we work with, in situations where people might um, be rude to us, we'll just say people are rude to us and we're, we're coming back at them with love and people see it and they're like, wow, it's an interesting way of going about things, but that's just the, the way that we've been doing it. And I think just, um, like as the universe throws us curveballs, just kind of being there with it and being present with it and seeing it, we have to adjust ourselves to what's being thrown at us if we want this to succeed. So like just the shift from being there with the kids every day to being in the office all the time and being okay with it and realizing that's what the universe had in store for us. So being okay with us going from being able to practice from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. every day to barely have enough time like to squeeze in a meditation, but just being okay with that and just seeing it like, okay, we're, we're going down this path. This is where we're going and, and just really kind of walking it and, and, and see whatever happens, happens. We're going to walk that path.